Hi, everyone. I'm Doug DeVos, and welcome back to Believe. My guest today is Michael Anton. He's a popular writer, speaker, and public thinker about all things politics. I'm going to ask him, why does everyone seem to hate Washington, D.C., no matter which party is in power? Michael has some strong opinions. Not everyone's going to agree with him, but he brings up some tough and divisive topics. But I believe everyone has a right to say what's on their mind when it comes to figuring out how we fix our country. We need more speech, not less. And we need more listening, too, even if we disagree. Now, let's see what Michael Anton believes. We believe and have always believed in this country that man was created in the image of God, that he was given talents and responsibilities and was instructed to use them to make this world a better place in which to live. And you see, this is the really great thing of America. It's time to discover what binds us together. And finding it has the power to transform our world. That's what I believe. How about you? Well, hi, everyone. I'm Doug DeVos, and welcome to Believe. We're glad to have you joining us here today. Today, the topic is uh, it's government. We're not talking politics. We're talking about government, the idea of government. How does this work? How does a society come together and, and act as a society, act as a group of people uh, that are trying to figure out how to work together or live in harmony? Of course, history has all sorts of, uh, of lessons that we can learn, and our own founding you know, brought us some uh, you know, ideas ideas that were revolutionary, obviously, at the, at the time that it was done. But we sit today at a time where, where most of the time we're kind of frustrated with our government, where we spend a lot of time talking or complaining, a lot of news shows about what's right or what's wrong with it. Uh, and, and so we wanted to explore this topic and kind of get to the core of what we believe about government, what we believe the role of government should be in our lives and how possibly it could or should work. So we want to dive into why the frustration that we have. Let's learn and explore that a little bit and then try to pivot a bit to what we really believe about this and how we can maybe move forward in that belief with some actions that we take in our lives. So we have a, a wonderful guest. Michael Anton is with us here uh, today. Uh, Michael is, uh, you know, is you know, incredibly uh, uh, adept at these topics. Uh, well, well, you know, it, unbelievably educated, highly intelligent. And he's an original thinker on uh, on many of these sorts of topics, uh, and really is an intellectual leader. Uh, when it comes to uh, to this sort of uh, area, and so we're honored to have him to uh, to join us. He has a background in business, he has a background in government service, and a background uh, in academic service, and uh, with the Claremont Institute, and now currently with Hillsdale uh, College. So uh, uh, we are just uh, thrilled, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, being here with us. Let me start a little bit. I'll just kind of start with the with the biggest uh, questions here. Help us understand. Some of the frustrations that people have with Washington, what, beyond just you know, this issue or that issue, what's a little deeper? What, what is, might be the cause uh, of why things just don't seem to be working uh, the way they should? Well, uh, there's a number of causes. I can think of two uh, just off the top of my head. One is it's incompetent, and the other is to the extent that it has power and can effectively use power, it uses it against the people rather than for the people. So, I, you know, I don't know what the federal budget is. I don't keep track of this anymore. It's kind of meaningless, these numbers, but it's got to be, it's many trillions of dollars, four trillion, five trillion, whatever. So it's spending, uh, um, you know, a massive amount of money. And then you have to ask yourself, what do you, what do you get for it? Well, wh we don't get, um, you know, we don't get protection uh, from uh, various things that government's supposed to protect you from. Foreign power, I mean, thankfully we're not being, uh, invaded by an armed foreign power. You could argue we're being invaded uh, at the southern border, but at least not by an army, but by a migrant flow that the government either can't control or refuses to control, won't do anything about. Um, we've certainly been uh, vastly taken advantage of by foreign powers in the economic realm, above all China, and the government either won't do anything about that or it colludes with certain financial and business interests to prevent anyone from doing anything about that. Uh, and so you get job losses, factory closures, outsourcing, all these kinds of things. And you either, if you're a normal person witnessing this and you complain about it, you hear one of two answers back and often the same two answers at the same time. The first is that's not happening. Everything is great. Tr trade benefits everybody. Stop complaining. 
And the second is a kind of resigned, well, those are just the laws of economics. There's nothing anybody could do about this. The thing I just told you that wasn't happening and that was great, now I'm telling you, you just have to suck it up and accept because nobody can do anything about it. So they hear contradictory answers. And, you know, these are not, these aren't, you don't have to be a sophisticated, educated person to realize that you're being lied to, that these three things that are being said at the same time can't add up to a coherent answer. Um, and then, and then you see things like, you know, when the government really wants to act, so it, 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 it allows 200 and this is a number that I've been using. I, I have a source for it, but if anybody wants to quibble about it, I'm happy to go back to my source. Something like 220 cities were set on fire and looted massively in 2020. And let's, let's say it's not just the federal government that's the problem, but there were state and county governments all over the country that refused to do anything about this, or to the extent that they made a handful of desultory arrests, they let everybody go afterward and didn't charge them. But when the government really wants to stomp you, it'll do it. So if you go into the Capitol on January 6th, where a cap, there's video of a Capitol police officer holding the door open for you, I'm not saying that was a wise or a prudent thing to do, but you do that, they will they will use all their power. They will track you down. They will hold you in pretrial detention for up to a year and sentence you to very long sentences. But loot, burn, smash, as long as you as long as the government feels like you're on the side of the ruling regime, you're free to go. You're good to go. No problem. People see that. And then they see the to getting back to incompetence. We see the crazy response to COVID. First, it's no big deal. It's nothing. It's go shopping downtown. You know, Nancy Pelosi, go, make sure you go to the restaurants in Chinatown because it's racist to worry about this virus. And then it's don't wear a mask. Masks don't help at all. We need to save them for the professionals. Then, then we flip, we turn on a dime to mask mandates everywhere. And then it's, well, we have a vaccine and this is behind us, but now the vaccine is going to need an endless number of booster shots. And every time we think we're over it, we get a new variant. So people are looking at this and saying, you don't really know what you're doing, do you? You don't know what this thing might be dangerous. It might not be dangerous. It might be medium dangerous, highly, uh, you know, we don't, you, but you guys don't know. And every new pronouncement you make, you try to make sound as authoritative as possible, like the word of God from Mount Sinai. And two days later, you fundamentally change it and you accept us to, uh, you expect us to accept that is just as authoritative, and they see through that. I, I love those all those examples and the ways that that uh, you know, that uh, it, it sounds you, you you identify two causes: incompetence and then the, the use of power. But it's really tough when the incompetent people seem to have the, all the use of power uh, and, and and find ways to exploit it and use it. And and I think the most recent example with COVID is is a very frustration, uh, a very frustrating situation that people are trying to understand where truth really is. How do we find our way to truth? Because, you know, where are sources and how can we find our way through the, you know, through the, uh, you know, the myriad of, of, of information that's coming at us to get to truth on some of these issues, to get to understanding some of these facts, to get to a, a, a place where, where you can have a bit of clarity? Well, that's hard. And unfortunately, what I said earlier that you know you don't have to be sophisticated or educated to see through the falsehoods uh, of the this ruling clique, whatever you want to call it. Unfortunately, you do have to be kind of sophisticated to find the truth about these things. So, if you want to sit down and educate yourself about COVID and read, you know, Alex Berenson and some of the other you know serious authors that have that have the either the medical or the reporting or the analytical chops to go through, or some combination of those, to go through all of this and write long substack posts that and show charts. You can you can find out information. Now, this is the average person in the middle of the country who's got a job, maybe two jobs, who's hustling kids off to school into various athletic and other extracurricular events, who maybe has to take care of a sick relative, who's got to do the shop, all of this stuff. Are they going to sit down and comb through all of that and really make an informed decision the likelihood is probably no, because they don't have the analytical, uh, you know, training and that kind of thing, or the time to do it all. So this, these are the kinds of people who I think are being very ill served by the nonsense, and and I think the people who run the messaging for the regime, as I like to call it, derisively, <laughs> know that, and they say, well, we can just basically tell these people whatever we we want because they don't have uh, the time or the ability to go and kind of track it all down and find out for themselves, and then the handful of people who will sit there and do the work 
and really look into all of the nonsense, there'll be few of enough of them and we'll just demonize them and call them conspiracy theorists and fringers and make sure nobody listens to them. So it's really hard. It, the truth is out there and it can be found. The truth is, 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 is hard for, uh, I think, the regime to outright suppress, but it's easier to just, it's very easy for them to bury it under so many layers of propaganda and nonsense that it takes uh, a, a more or less full-time job to find it. And most people don't have the um, uh, ability or the time to expend uh, a full-time effort looking for these things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we all have struggles with that. I, I, you know, you find this bit of information and that bit, and you talk to a lot, a lot of smart people, and even a lot of smart people have different, you know, views and and how they, you know, may you know be a couple degrees different. But trying to sort it all out is just incredibly complicated. So let's talk. Let's kind of turn it from truth to trust. So if you're trying to trust our government. Uh, you know, is there any reason, or even, I'll go beyond just our government, other institutions, I, I'll point my finger at business. Uh, let's talk about, you know, education. So these are these, these institutions in our society that, that we've been able to go to in the past to kind of trust or, or, or have a consistent position. But you talked about some of the, the collusion or some of the uh, corporate cronyism uh, that happens, uh, you know, at times. I, I, I'm, I'm a business person, um, and, and you can kind of see it from time to time how, how when, uh, you know, when, you know, when, when people come together in, in a way that's in their interest but not in the public's interest, uh, there can be some serious problems there. So how do we get to a, a level of trust then in our institutions and ultimately in our government? Well, I don't know. I mean, we, usually that's a one-way street. You have it at the beginning, you establish it, and then you can either cultivate it and, you know, um, work to bolster it, or you can take that trust, exploit it, and spend it down in short-term, for short-term gain. And that's unfortunately what pretty much every institution in the country, governmental and societal, has been doing over the last generation or so, and vastly accelerated over the last 10 years, and then vastly accelerated from that over the last five years. I don't see how they get it back, to be perfectly honest. And to be even more honest, I don't think they deserve to get it back. So uh, it may be better for us to think about kind of wholesale root and branch reform than how do we make CNN, you know, uh, uh, the the old straight news uh, down the middle cable outlet that it was born as or that everybody you know everybody became sort of familiar cnn had been on the air for 10 years but when gulf war one started in 1990 91 that's when the whole world started watching cnn and they pretty much told you what was going on in, in iraq and kuwait right and right. i think they they lived off the half-life of the credibility they had built up with that for 20 years and they've squandered it all and not only do i not think they can get it back they don't deserve to get it back so I, some of these institutions, I just think, are not really worth saving necessarily. They've destroyed themselves. They have no shame. They have no remorse. They can't admit that they were wrong about anything. Every once in a while, they get caught red-handed doing something horrible, so they fire Chris Cuomo or whatever. But I don't. I, I, look, it takes a long time to build up trust, and you can squander it in a day. And once you have. Uh, I'm not sure that the same institution with all the same people running it. I mean, if if everybody left and the whole place were were cleaned out and a whole new, entirely new crop of people came in and they had a totally different outlook, well, maybe. But I think we both know that's not going to happen. Yeah, not not going to happen. And and to take a an institution and turn it from somebody who's lost trust, you're right to to. Uh... Now it's harder. Like I don't care if CNN goes under, but um, you know the Department of Justice and the FBI. I mean, these things are going to be around whether we like them or not. Um, now my my late colleague who died this year, Angelo Cotavilla, uh, argued for wholesale reform and even the abolishment and dismantlement of some uh, government agencies. And if that has to happen, I, I think there, there may be no other way. At a minimum, though, some of these agencies need to do what I said, which is completely clean house, not make one or two changes at the top, not have a fake IG investigation that ends with a vague conclusion that wrongdoing was committed, but that nobody needs to be held accountable. You know, if, if I, I mean, I, I personally, I don't trust the FBI anymore. It has no credibility with me. It lies. It selectively prosecutes. It trumps certain things up. It plays other things down. Right. Now, the FBI obviously doesn't care about what I think about its credibility. It knows it can do to me whatever it wants. It has power. And if it wants to come and get me, it can come and get me. And there's nothing I can do about it. If it cares about what I think and others of me think about it, though, um, this, those are the things it would have to do. And since it's not going to do them, it would require political pressure from above, 
require congressional legislation to completely change it in executive action. I don't foresee any of those things on the horizon. Right. You, you know, at, at some point, institutions or businesses or organizations uh, turn the corner and it's all about self-preservation rather than the original mission that they wanted to do in the first place. You know, it, it, at least in the business world, the, the the businesses tend to go out of business eventually. A number of years ago, we looked at businesses that were, you know, the top 10 businesses, you know, 50 years ago and realized that, you know, four of them ceased to exist. Something happened in the market. Something happened with their decisions where they, where they you know, they went out of business and they went away over time. But uh, it doesn't seem to happen with some of these, you know, institutions and government and nor the, the you know, the political will, certainly the internal discipline uh, to do what's necessary to, to reform, like you're saying. No, it would have to. This is politics. So in politics, you know, the market rewards failure or certainly the market doesn't punish failure, right? Things change only when they're forced to from the top, which means the constitutional officers that have statutory, sorry, not statutory, constitutionally enumerated powers to force these agencies to change or to take away their budgets or to cut their personnel or to change their mandate by law, all of those powers have got to be used to see reform. And I don't see an appetite to use those powers among the, the constitutional officers of the government right now. If anything, sadly and frighteningly, the constitutional officers are more afraid of the administrative state, the permanent government, than the administrative state is of them. Now on paper, it shouldn't be that way. The constitutional officers have got all of these enumerated powers that should allow them to exert their will or the people's will as channeled through them over them over these administrative state bureaucratic non-elected agencies but they don't use it in part i think for two reasons one is that you know a good portion of the government the elected government let's say half let's maybe it's more than half just believes in their mission and thinks they're the good guys and so why would we want to change anything that they're doing um, and then the half that actually sees that there's a problem is afraid of them with reason. I mean, as Chuck Schumer said, I don't know, three, four years ago, he said, boy, I caution Trump against um, uh, picking a fight with the intelligence community. They have six ways to Sunday to get back at you, which was an extraordinary statement. This was the uh, essentially the Senate minority leader at the time. So, um, you know, one of the one of the very senior most members of the United States Senate, the, the leader of the opposition party telling the president of the United States, don't mess with this unelected bureaucracy because they have ways to harm you that you can't do anything about. And he wasn't warning him. He was cackling about it approvingly. He was saying, this is a stupid fight for Trump to get in, but I welcome it because I want to see this unelected bureaucracy punish my political enemy, the, the constitutionally elected president. You just know the government isn't functioning the way it's supposed to when people talk like that and pay no price for it. Well, you, you, you've hit on a subject. I think that's really important for for anyone in our audience to, to really think through. You know, I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan, the home of, uh, you know, Gerald R. Ford, the uh, 36th president of the United States. And, and he, you know, he his love for Congress, all he ever wanted to do was be the Speaker of the House. He was in the middle of that institution. And I, I, I often think sometimes of how they have just delegated and given away their power to, to the administration and how, how the, 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 you know, the absence of aligning with what the Constitution gave them, they just delegated it away. It's like if you're, you know, if you're asked to be a leader or if you're a parent or something, you just kind of delegate your responsibility to, to a bunch of other people and then, and then think it's great without paying attention to what's really going on. It just, it breaks my heart. I, I, I actually, spent a little time, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I wrote about this on Constitution Day in an op-ed that, that, that the ability for unelected parts of our government to take power further and further away from the people where it was intended to be in the first place is, is a hugely dangerous thing. Do you think that that's something that uh, erodes trust and that people can see easily, or is it too well hidden? No, uh, well, hidden. I mean, the average person doesn't contact these agencies or the way they operate in the day-to-day -day life aside from you know let's say you're older and you're getting a social security check but that's sort of the extent of it you're not where where they notice if they notice is that nobody nobody really knows what the law is anymore the law has become so complicated there's so many of them and every new one passed is a 2000 page monstrosity that you can't possibly understand it but worse than that, a law isn't a law. So when Congress passes a law, really what they pass is a delegation 
to the administrative state to write the so-called rules. And the rules are the real laws and they're written in the bureaucracy. So a 2000 page law becomes 10,000 pages, pages worth of rules that you know the most sophisticated lawyers in the country can't even understand. They have to specialize because you can only, under, you know, one human mind, even if a very, very smart, uh, extremely well-educated only has so much capacity to know so much law. And he's got a, the law is now so vast that it requires even the best lawyers to specialize into a small part of it. So you walk around as a citizen and, you know, in a, in a healthy society, the, the citizen basically knows what the laws are, knows what, what, what is allowed, what is forbidden, what is required, and so on. You don't have that anymore. And, and, and then you instead you have all of the selective prosecution and selective enforcement, which leads to a kind of a, a bewilderment and then cynicism, which is to say, you know, the only common thread the normal person can see is who's getting punished and who's getting rewarded and who's getting leniently treated. And there are threads there that are detectable, right? If you're friendly with a certain part of the of the government, if you're friendly with a certain outlook, a certain part of society, you tend to be either rewarded or leniently treated when you do something wrong, with rare exceptions. If you're unfriendly, they come down on you with a with a with everything they have. And in, in all cases, they say, well, this is the law, but it's it's so selective, it's not really the law. It's prosecutorial discretion and administrative state, administrative judge discretion, bureaucratic regulatory discretion is in fact the law. It's what the people occupying these jobs want to do at a given moment and to whom they want to do it. And everybody, again, a normal, unsophisticated, um, normally educated, in other words, they didn't go on to 17 uh, postgraduate degrees, can see that, can understand that. You don't need a PhD to see that that's what's going on. And that induces cynicism. And Washington doesn't really care about the cynicism. Washington cares about obedience and acquiescence. So it cares about the cynicism when people speak up about it too much because they don't want people's words to undermine le the legitimacy of the regime. And they really don't want it to undermine obedience. So like right now, we're witnessing the spectacle of people. I, I said this before who entered the Capitol. Um, take whatever opinion you want about, about that event. As I said, it, you know, the... The people of the people who died, first of all, they lied to us endlessly about it. The Capitol police officer who died was uh, the first the thing the regime said was he was beaten to death by MAGA protesters with a fire extinguisher. Completely untrue. Um, and we now know that he died a day after the event from a pre-existing medical condition. All that swept under the rug. It was useful at the time to paint the protesters as um, as violent. So of the other deaths, we know one was shot who was unarmed and shot by a Capitol police officer who faced no consequences for doing that. It appears that another one was um, trampled or beaten in some tunnel. And there's some evidence. I would encourage you to read Julie Kelly's great reporting at American Greatness on this. And it's a developing story and not all the facts have come out because the regime is trying to keep the facts from coming out. Um, who may have been, uh, there may have been some officer involvement in that. It's still unclear. A couple of others had medical events. Okay. So what they want to tell you is this was a gigantic, you know, uh, a violent rage riot intended to overthrow the government when in fact, you know, I, I, the same people who used the phrase mostly peaceful over and over again throughout 2020 use, uh, you know, insurrection about January 6th. Well, what they're doing now is as they go through and, you know, charge these people, try them, it's not enough to have done a years of pretrial detention to get convicted to go to jail. The judges are requiring people to essentially make these absurd statements or confessions, right? Read some of them. It's called an allocution in legalese, right? It's where you go before the judge and you say, I understand what I did. And you can just tell people are saying things they don't really believe. That is to say, they're not merely saying, yes, I trespassed and I realized that was against the law. I'll take my punishment. But they have to give a political statement of how they didn't realize that all their prior views that led them to that were wrong. And if they don't do that, they're going to get extra time and more punishment from the government. Now, is this being widely covered? No, no. it's being covered by people um, on my side, more or less, who are trying to show that this is unjust and this isn't right. I mean, it should be enough for an honest judicial system to say, this is the law you broke very specifically. You trespassed, okay? That's a federal crime. You shouldn't have been here at this time. And you look at it, you examine that with your lawyer and you say, all right, look, I did trespass. I can't deny it. It's on video and all of this. I'm going to plead guilty to that. 
for the government to add this extra layer of now you're going to make a confession about your political views and about other views, or I'm going to punish you more harshly. That's not the way American justice is supposed to work. Only one group of people or people from one side of the current partisan divide are getting that kind of treatment. The other side are not. And people notice that. And that's, you know, this fairness and this equal, you know, equal treatment under the law, you know, just seems pretty fundamental. And there's something about, you know, you, you've referenced it in, 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 a, in a number of cases, you know, when, when a mob gets together, when a group of people get somewhat out of control, and I think our founders were very nervous about that uh, you know, at the time that, uh, and I remember uh, in one of the discussions we had with the, uh, at the National Constitution Center, you know, you, you would talk about, you know, a phrase I remember as a kid is called the Riot Act. My, you know, things would go wrong at the house. The kid and my parents would say, we're going to read you the Riot Act. And I found out that there was a real thing such as the Riot Act, that, that when there was a mob or a riot, that the, the, who, whoever in the town square would read, hey, there's a Riot Act, so just remember what's going to happen when this is all said and done. So how, how do we, you know, go back, going back, how do we find a way to, to have that equal, equal treatment, you know, and, and to administer justice you know, in a way that um, that isn't selective. And you reference this, and again, another an, another time, you know, I think there's over 300,000 laws that have been created. How can, there's no way any of us can follow you know, or think through all of those things with all the law, the lawyers that are going to need to be there. You know, how do we, you know, stop this over-criminalization of everything, but, and even going into how you think? I mean, the only way within the constitutional system that we have is to just elect an entirely new class of senators and representatives and ultimately a president who will and then the senators and the representatives have to use their legislative power to force changes they've got to they've got to um, force changes on these agencies um, use their budgetary power to strip funding that enables these agencies to do what they do um, use their oversight powers to say L- let's look at what you know how you've how you've abused your regulatory powers, how you've abused your enforcement powers, hold people accountable, and presidents who will appoint and and senates that will confirm into positions into these agencies, people absolutely committed to reform, to um, getting them back in, in within the constitutional lane that they're supposed to be in, and this is just going to be an an enormous fight, and I I see an appetite for the fight among certain people. I don't see, however, nearly enough of these types of people getting elected and exerting their powers. Right, right. I see very few. And some, and then, you, you know, you see sort of a handful who talk a good game, but they don't really act when they get in Congress. And, and then some who talk a good game and want to act, but don't know how to, how to, how to use the powers of, uh, of their offices because um, Washington is complicated and it actually, there is something to be said for experience in town, but the, the, the downside, the flip side, uh, uh, is that the more experienced you get with how to operate in Washington, the more you tend to be co-opted by Washington and to go along. So, you know, you 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 have the you can have a maverick outsider who doesn't know how to move the levers, or you can have a real smooth operating insider who does. They tend not to have maverick views. So we somehow we need a whole new generation, a majority in both houses of Congress that both know how to move the levers of power and have maverick views. Now that's kind of pipe dreamy. I don't know how to accomplish that. But I think that's the only way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Let me let me ask kind of a, a contrarian sort of perspective. You mentioned that in the midst of this, in the midst of this, some people are happy with how things are going. You know, I talk a little bit about the unhappiness, but in every poll, there's at least a group of people that that seem to be happy or seem to like that. Where does that come from, and how can we understand, or how should we understand, or think about? Um, you know, you know, people who, uh, you know, or, or a, I shouldn't say people, a perspective that that uh, really encourages uh, government to have more and more control in our lives, to have more and more decisions uh, over our individual, you know, uh, opportunities and things of that nature. Is, is is there a stream of thought or or, or an academic position on uh, on how that could or should work? I'm actually not convinced that anybody's really happy with the current system. I think you have. My read is more that you have two categories now, the kind of people we've been talking about who are definitely not happy with it because they don't like the direction. Mm -hmm. There's another category who like the direction, but still think it hasn't gone nearly far enough. And they can and and they think that, you know, as long as any vestige of the old system remains, then we're stuck with 
you know, structural racism and inequality and, you know, all the, all the things that the American founding and America itself and American history have been criticized for viciously by the left over the last 50 to 100 years. And, and, and my read of these people uh, is that I don't think they can ever be satisfied. I think fundamentally they're utopians and they think, you know, they have a, they, they I was going to say they have a vision of perfection in their head. I don't even think they have that because, you know, no matter what happens, okay, we have to change this. We have to reform that. Have you ever seen one of these left-wing utopians go, yeah, that now everything is better. No, they immediately move on to the next crusade and it's just as urgent, maybe more urgent than the last one. And the pitch of their demands just rises and rises and rises. I don't think they can be satisfied. So this is one of the reasons why I think uh, America is such a, a kind of unhappy place right now politically is you have one side that doesn't like the changes and another side who thinks no change can ever be enough, which is it's permanent revolution. And I, that just doesn't bode well for the future as far as I'm concerned. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting uh, per perspective there. And does that, that lack of satisfaction come with the fact that there's somebody else out there that has power? Is this, a, is this an, un, uh, uh, an unchecked um, aspiration to have all the power, all the controls, only when government or when the leaders of government have all the power will they be satisfied? But you know, as you said, maybe they'll never no, be satisfied. They'll never, but... they'll, ne they'd never, they'll never be satisfied. I don't think they can admit that they'd be satisfied. I, I think this is the philosophy student in me coming out. It arises from just a fundamental misperception of reality. I mean, one of the things that ancient philosophy tries to get across to people is there's only so much human beings can do in this world. So you have to moderate your hopes and dreams. You've got to be willing to accept less and make compromises because perfection and heaven on earth are impossible. And the striving for them will create more misery and chaos than accepting certain inevitable evils and imperfections. And they just won't, they can't accept that and reject it root and branch. There's something psychologically, there's something in the mind of people like this that makes it impossible. I don't think it's in the mind genetically permanently, right? I mean, because people haven't always been this way. Maybe some people have always been this way. But right now, it's the kind of thing, if you if you tried to talk, you know, um, one of the, a, a more, a, a very committed left winger on these things out of this view that they can utopianize the world, the response to you will be anger. You know, I'm always, I'm all for the, the power of the individual and the power of somebody to dream and aspire to do great things and to achieve great things, uh, you know, but, and, and you've seen some, you know, amazing accomplishments by, by people throughout history and even happening today, um, but nobody's perfect. You know, my, my, my mother well, gave... Well, I mean, and we're, but we're, <laughs> the difference we're talking about is the difference between what individuals can achieve and what a society can achieve. Even with the former, you're still going to face limits, you know, I mean... Everybody, everybody, you know, there's, I think of how many kids have big dreams of being, I don't know, a, a professional athlete or an actor or an actor, and very few of them make it. So on the one hand, you don't want to crush young people's dreams because it's good to dream. It's good to aspire. It's good to try. And on the other and, and because you don't really know this person could be the next great athlete or the next great whatever. Right, right. Um, but on the other hand, you, you also don't want to give the message that um, if you fall short of that, you're worthless or you failed. Right. Because most of us are going to have normal, ordinary lives. Most of us aren't going to be superstars. And the world has to be oriented around the most of the, around the majority of people who are just going to be normal and live normal lives and have kids and have a home and maybe a little cabin somewhere. And it's 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 not the, the grand life. Maybe they were dreaming about when they were 10 or when they were 17. But it's a good life. It's a worthy life. It's a fulfilling life. When you move it out to society, that's where you really have the problem. It's much more likely that some individual who is completely free and has every opportunity can hit it big and, and you know and, and make it to the big time the, uh, that's po that's at least possible um, it's not possible ever to perfect any society ever and that should be drummed into people from a young age so that they don't get this kind of utopian insanity into them that causes them to reject every good thing about a given society and want to tear it down and rebuild it on a, on a rolling basis. But uh, unfortunately, we've done the opposite and we're paying the price for it. And it's not, it, 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 the tide hasn't turned yet on that way of thinking. And, it, and, and as I say, we're really paying a price for that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what you describe when somebody has a, a, a chance to live a life, the, the biggest thing in my mind is that it's their life. 
they get to choose. You know, if they, you know, if they want to, you know, have a family or not have a family, if they want to move forward in one direction or another direction, it's their their opportunity. They get to choose, not somebody else who's trying to create this, you know, you know, perfect society and puts them in a place. I, we had a lot of uh, of operations years ago. We still do in in Eastern Europe, and I would talk to people before the wall came down, <clears throat> who would talk about how they were limited in choice and how they were chosen to do this or that or the other thing, whether they wanted to or not. And, and just the, the the stories and the despair that they had at that time for not having a choice to pursue you know, what they wanted to do, how, however modest it may have been, um, and, and it was powerful. Uh, and, and so this I, this idea that that people want to take power away from an individual so they can have it, and then maybe return a little bit of power to fulfill a role in this grander scheme that that somebody else has thought about. Is, you know, seems to, to, to really be troubling. Yeah, I, I mean, government, you know, that's where we started, right? Yeah. It ought to be oriented around, it seems to me, the normal, ordinary case. We have too much oriented government around extremes. Um, uh, it's, and, and, and not even in an intelligent way in that. So, you know, for instance, if you are going to ordinary uh, orient government around the extreme, some attention, a lot of attention really ought to be paid on on the upper extreme, right? The, the extremely talented, the very smart to make sure they develop their talents and we get the most out of them. And we don't, we don't really do that now. We, we, we sort by demographic category and we punish and reward by demographic category rather than by excellence, regardless of demographic category. And we seem to be doing more and more of that. Uh, the one thing though, government and our society overall seems to despise the most, is just the, 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 just the regular person, the middle person, the middle of the road person. Maybe it's a high school graduate, maybe somebody who got two years, an associate's degree at a community college, or someone who went to their local state college for four years, but is never going to be partner at a big time law firm and do doesn't aspire to that. Um, government doesn't really, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have much to offer those people anymore. And to the extent that, uh, yeah. I, I, I would say in some respects, it actively hurts them. All the, the decades of outsourcing that we've done have actively hurt these people in these communities. The de facto open borders that we've had now for, for most of my lifetime have, have actively hurt these communities. The complete indifference to the opioid epidemic or even, um, you know, certain sectors of societies, medical, uh, you know, certain doctors and, and so on and pharmaceutical industries in, in pushing the opioid crisis have hurt these people. That's not what the government should be doing. Government should be taking the temperature of the, a, the average health of the average family, the average person, the average community, and getting an accurate assessment of what that is, and then trying to address it directly with policies that are going to make their lives better. And we don't, we don't do that. Government doesn't do that. And I think people people know that, that government doesn't do that. And so that's another reason why they're cynical about it. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's take a couple thoughts here, and, and we, we've talked about power and how it goes away, and, and ultimately, okay, we have to win an election. But what are some of the practical things that people can do, just in, in, in either in their own lives or as they think about this? What are the the positions that they can consider for themselves uh, uh, about their lot in life, about how they can be empowered? Uh, in, in the environment that we're in today. Maybe government's not going to go back and do something different. They're probably not going to change, like you said, as they get entrenched. But what do we need to think about, what, from your perspective, what do we need to think about to encourage people from all spectrums, from all backgrounds, to, to say, take back charge of your life? How, how would that look? Well, uh, before you even get to government, I guess it would look uh, just organizing your, you know, to borrow a phrase from Barack Obama, which he didn't invent, organizing your own communities, you know, I mean, just doing things with neighbors and friends so that you reduce your dependence uh, and on the state or on, uh, on others and increase your dependence on one another and your mutual independence. Right. So, you know, you know, start working with local businesses, you know, instead of being reliant on giant corp, you know, corporations that don't know you or care about you, see if you can, you know, Join a food collective, buy your food from local farmers uh, in, in, in conjunction with other families doing the same thing. There are all kinds of things you can do like that, that people are doing. And by the way, when regime outlets notice this, they get angry. So for instance, the New York Times, not that long ago, a month or two ago, had an article talking about the inherent racism of farmers markets. I mean, of farmers markets 
Why is this? Well, I, I guess it's because the people doing the buying and the growing and the selling, they're in the demographic category that the regime in the New York Times doesn't like. So they go to the only epithet that they know or the one that is their go to, which is this, this must be racist. Now, remember, I, I, it wasn't that long ago that lefty outlets like that were praising farmers markets and organic stuff as you know a part of the locavore movement, meaning eat locally. This was good when it was liberals doing it. As soon as anybody not a committed leftist does it, it's racist. Um, now, beyond that, in politics, you know, I would start at the lowest possible level and work your way up. Uh, uh, too many on the right only think about D.C. And, and only think about the presidency. They just want to win that. And they think of once we've won that, you know, we can we can we can do what we want to do. I think we learned from the Trump administration. If We should have known it already, but we know now that's not true. Um, it's really hard to affect change from within D.C., even if you have the White House, unless you were to get, as I said, this big, big cadre of people with maverick views, but knowledge of how to move the levers of government power. We don't have that yet. So we could build that though. And you build it, you know, you think about this like a, like a farm team system. You don't put people in the majors for their first at bat. Maybe there's an exceptional player every once in a while, but let's start at the, you know, at the little league and then the high school and maybe college and then triple A, sorry, single A, double A, triple A before we go to the major. So let's start getting people on city councils and town councils and boards of supervisors and state legislatures and commissions and all of these things getting, first of all, they can do some good in these spots. Second of all, they will learn politics. They will learn how the levers of power work. And third, they'll build a network of, of like-minded people who share their goals and let them rise through the ranks and through the offices and then that cadre that I'm talking about that we need, which we're not going to we're not going to recruit it for 2022 or 24. There's not enough people out there. But if you spend 10 or 20 years building it by having people who are serious, committed and have the hearts in the right place, and their minds in the right place, you know, go through the drudgery. I mean, let's face it. It's a time. It's a sacrifice. It's probably boring. I mean, we've all I don't know if we all have, but some of us certainly have sat through, you know, local government hearings about garbage pickup or some very mundane issue. And you think, golly, that's boring. And I'm a busy person. And I'm, you know, I've achieved this in my life. Therefore, that's beneath me. I don't want to do it. Well, if you don't do it, you know, another thought from ancient philosophy. Um, if you don't do it, that means somebody else is going to do it. And they may not be as good as you and they may not share your views. So maybe you need to suck it up and, uh, and exactly. do the unpleasant stuff, lest it be left to someone who's going to do it in a way you don't like. Yeah, interesting uh, th thought there, and and that's where it kind of connects. Help us connect a little bit. The you know you know we we talk a lot about politics, government. That's where we started this you know this conversation. But how does it relate back to culture? A lot of conversations uh, you know that that I've had with people talked about the the virtues of individuals that people have to be be virtuous to be able to maintain or enhance or or grow. A, you know, freedom in a society that there has to be a, a, a fundamental base, and, and with that, as you said, is that individual willing to serve in government, putting their their perspective into that service that could start to have a chance in government. So help, help us understand yeah. that from a kind of it gets a little personal. How do we create our own individual culture and, and work in that neighborhood around us? I mean, there's always a balance. There should always be a balance between the needs of the individual and the needs of society. You know, as I. Um, you can you could go too far in either direction. So too far, uh, you know, take ancient Sparta would be an example of where complete dedication to the common good at, at the almost utter obviation of any concern for the individual. Like nobody wants to live in, nobody that I know wants to live in. I like reading about ancient Sparta sometimes, yeah. but I don't want to live in ancient Sparta where I have no personal or private life at all and my whole life is dedicated to the state. Um, on the other hand, this you know, conservatives, especially in the in the eighties and nineties, I think overemphasized individualism to their ultimate detriment. That is to say, you know, they downplayed all kinds of connective ties of citizenship, of civic friendship, of community. It's all about individual freedom, and that's the conservative value par excellence, and that's what the liberals are out to attack. Well, you know. No, I mean, who lives like that? N nobody I know actually lives like that. We want to see our friends. We want to see our family. We want to live in a community where there's people we know, there's people we get along with, there's people we like, where we cooperate. That's the whole basis of the state, of any government. And in fact, I'm enough of, a, of, a, of an Aristotelian, for lack of a better term, to say that I don't believe that human beings can exist without government. There's going to be government of some kind or one another. There's going to be, you know, you, you form government to do things that, 
you can't do on your own. Individuals can't do individually or singly. They must be together. We need, I think conservatives need now um, to back off the emphasis on it, not, not give up on, I'm not saying we're going back to Sparta, right? But the, that heyday of radical individualism is, is, or should be over. What we need is more cooperation amongst one another, uh, focus on shared goals and focus on our collective power, our collective ability to make change. Cause the individual, I'll tell you one thing, if what we're worried about most right now is the overweening power of the state. And, and, and we shouldn't just be talking about Washington because some of the state governments are, are every bit or if at least almost as bad. And, and we've seen many of the city governments around this country are abysmal too in counties and so on. What the, the individual against this behemoth is just an ant that's going against a bulldozer. You can't make any headway at all. So an emphasis on individualism, if we're trying to politically, collectively reform the American governmental system is at this point, I think counterproductive. Um, we need, we need rather more, I mean, the emphasis on individual rights as the philosophical basis of our government. Sure. But what we need to be thinking about more is joint collective action amongst ourselves, where our unified strength is our greatest asset. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great thought to, uh, to, to bring us home here as we kind of, to wrap things up, you know, this topic is, uh, you know, ha has a lot of perspectives and we all come together around it, but the whole idea of, uh, of finding, you know, finding a place, you know, and finding a, a, a spot where we can overcome the challenges or the frustrations that we have it, and not just complain about something that's distant, but, but bring it back home like you were just articulating. I, I think that's fabulous. Michael, as we kind of, as we wrap things up here, I'd love to hear any, any other thoughts of things that, uh, as we've gone through this discussion, have clicked in your mind that maybe I didn't ask you about or we didn't touch on yet, but that you think that uh, our audience would be interested in, in, in hearing as a thought. Again, the idea is how to... to, to to challenge ourselves to think about things, to to drive us on the inside, to take actions that may be a little different that would pursue uh, some of these bigger, uh, broader objectives. No, I never, I never actually have. You know, whenever I get to anything else you want to say, I usually am like, hmm, I found a way to say it <laughs> during what, <laughs> during what, uh, during the course of the conversation. Great. Well, well, Michael, I'm glad that you did because uh, you're you're incredibly articulated, uh, articulate, and, and knowledgeable uh, on these issues. You've helped our audience tremendously think through some of these things from a historical perspective, from a practical perspective, from a from you know from from where we're dealing with things uh, today, and, and some of the things that we need to think about so that we can shape our own perspective. So, thank you so much for uh, taking your time. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And to all of our uh, audience, thank you for being with us as well. Uh, we've had a great time with Michael Anton. I uh, hope this helps you think through where you are, where you're going, and what you can do to be a, a better person, a better neighbor, uh, and to have this perspective uh, in our society where we can uh, go forward together. And that's it for Believe. Thanks, everybody.